Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the City of London Group PLC Investor presentation relating to the interim results and future plans. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in a listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted any time via the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard. I'd also like to remind you this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Ben Peters, Head of Corporate Communications, Michael Goldstein, CEO of City of London Group PLC, and Jason Oakley, CEO of Recognised Bank. Good morning to you. Morning. Good morning. morning. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Ben Peters. I'm Head of Investor Relations at Recognised Bank. I'm joined today by Michael Goldstein, CEO of City of London Group PLC, and Jason Oakley, CEO of Recognised Bank. Morning. Over the next 30 minutes or so, Michael will give an overview of City of London Group and provide an update on the recent interims and then hand over to Jason, who will talk you through the recognised business, which he and his team have built over the last three years. Uh, during the session, uh, as we heard earlier, you're welcome to submit some questions and we will try to get through as many as possible. If we are unable to answer any questions, we will respond by email. Michael, over to you. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us this morning. So uh, City London Group is an, an A-listed company. Uh, market capitalization has been between somewhere between 65 and £70 million pounds over the last uh, few weeks and months. Um, I joined uh, City London Group as Chief Executive in October 17, and since then, we've been on a journey to create a lending business, and particularly to create a bank, which is what now we have uh, successfully achieved through our subsidiary recognized bank, which we'll talk about in more detail later. The other main business that we have in the, the group is Milton Homes. Milton Homes was uh, reversed into the uh, group in October 17 and is a uh, re reversionary residential property owning business. Uh, net asset as at the 30th of September is about 12.4 million pounds. And we own 460 residential properties which uh, are, are occupied from those people that the business acquired, that we acquired them from uh, back in the uh, 90s and early noughties. And we hold them until those people either pass away uh, or, or go into full-time uh, residential care, at which point we are able to sell the properties and realize the proceeds. So, so as at the 30th of September, we, we hold 460 of those properties, uh, which have a, a market value, um, a vacant value of 90 million pounds, but we hold them at 68.7 million pounds, which is the investment value. That business has been in runoff and continues to be in runoff. We haven't grown the portfolio. That business has not grown the portfolio uh, for about 13 years. And we're just now managing that business in wind down. And, and it's how we've managed to fund much of the investment into Recognised Bank. So over the last um, three years, we've, we've, we've had two fundraisers. Uh, we raised £15 million pounds in uh, March 19, and we had a successful £27 million pound fundraise uh, in October of 2020. And that really has now has enabled us to invest into Recognised Bank, which received its licence uh, in the last quarter of 2020. Uh, our results for the 30th of September were uh, really very positive. Uh, we benefited from uh, the uh, uptick in house price in inflation, which meant that the City London Group, excluding the investment, the monies that we spent on the recognised banking licence application, showed a small profit. Uh, we invested in the period £2.8 million pounds of uh, monies into the bank in actual operating ex expenditure. And so we showed a loss of £2.6 million, pounds, but obviously the rest of the business um, was, uh, was, was actually positive, was actually made a £0.2 million pounds, um, of profit. Uh, the um, board, as you can see in front of you, it's uh, many of us have been, in, uh, have been involved since October 17. But I would like to particularly pick out Ruth Parasol, who joined uh, in October 2020. Uh, she was uh, the main uh, contributor towards our £27 million pound fundraise in October 2020. She invested £25 million pounds on, of the £27 million pound investment. Uh, Ruth is a, a very successful entrepreneur. Uh, in her own right, self-made. And we're very excited that, that she has, having done a lot of due diligence on us for six or seven months during, during the course of 2020, uh, that actually, they, that, that she's committed, she's actually joined the board of both 
uh, City London Group, but also the, the, the banking subsidiary, Recognised Bank. And she's shown a great deal of commitment and interest uh, in our progress. And it's something that really we, we have taken as a, as a great vote of confidence uh, in our business plan and in the management team of the bank, which you'll hear about soon. So our opportunity, this is the one that we set up about three years ago, was to build a new SME focused bank. And I'm now delighted to introduce Jason Oakley, who's leading the banking subsidiary. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, just, just by way of background, just a very brief introduction. I've um, been in the industry for 35 years. I've been very fortunate and privileged to be responsible for a number of large SME franchises. So I was responsible for the RBS and NatWest SME franchise across the UK. Just to give you some context there, that's over 1.1 million SMEs. Um, at the time that I was responsible, that was about one in three uh, small businesses across the UK. We were originating several billion pounds of new debt a month across that. Um, probably most pertinent to the whole story about Recognised Bank, um, I built the Metro Bank book. I went in there after the, the license had been achieved in June 2010, and the lending book hadn't really moved an awful lot. When I joined two years later, it was 50 million pounds. Um, and I took that book from 50 million pounds to over two and a half billion pounds in under three years. I left just before the stock market float. So I left in March 15, so just shy of six years ago. Um, but we built that book and some of the principles and some of the success we achieved, um, we've incorporated into the recognised bank model. Um, so let me move on. Um, in terms of differentiation, one of, one of the things that saddens me a little bit is over the last decade, particularly since the last, the last financial crisis, we've seen a degradation in service for SMEs, a lack of relationship, a lack of focus. Um, and one of the critical things we want to bring, which differentiates our proposition, is taking the best in technology. And technology shouldn't be seen as a threat, but we should embrace the best in technology because it drives efficiency, it drives scalability. So we're using the best in cloud native technology and we're blending it critically with relationship management. And what I mean by that is access, access to decision makers, building a relationship, having somebody that knows something about you and your business, having a level of intimacy and responsiveness. And that's what's sadly been missing in the industry as a lot of SMEs have been forced migrated um, to call centres. So we're the first new bank, uh, as Michael said, we are a licensed bank. We're the first new bank to launch a fully integrated technology platform that I believe will transform um, in a way that maybe Starling and Monzo have transformed retail financial services. I'm also really pleased to say we, we as Michael said, we, um, we got our license in the middle of November. Um, but, you know, despite that only being a few weeks ago, we've now seen over £120 million pounds of new inquiries. Um, and that is rather more than we expected. Um, so the other thing that I'm very pleased about is the quality of some of the counterparties. So what I mean by that is that the borrowers have got long established businesses, they're profitable, they've got strong balance sheets, they're good counterparties. It's not distressed, uh, it's not distressed opportunities coming because nobody else will lend. These are good counterparties and actually margins are in, are in line with our expectation. I'm also pleased to advise that the top team that's running the bank has now been in situ for more than two years. So there's there's good continuity. Um, we've got an outstanding board. I will talk about the chairman who's particularly noteworthy, but generally speaking, an outstanding board at recognise. And critically, a track record of delivering over three decades, um, including in adding value and creating value in more difficult economic times, like what we're finding ourselves in right now with the, with the debilitating effects of COVID. So, as Michael mentioned, having previously raised over £40 million pounds via City of London, our parent, um, we're now looking to raise a minimum of £30 million pounds to um, allow us to remove the deposit restriction. So, we're licensed, we're a bank, 
but we need one further capital rise to remove the deposit restriction, which will allow us to take uh, deposits to fund our loan book. So the journey to becoming a bank is a long journey and, and that the standards are high, quite rightly, um, it should be a high bar. One of the reasons that that is the case is being given a full license means that any and every depositor is insured up to 85,000 for sole deposit accounts and up to 170,000 for joint accounts. So the journey we've been on has taken just over three years. Probably noteworthy is since March 20, when COVID struck, there's only been two new bank licenses awarded. The one to ourselves and uh, a premium bank proposition in a different segment. So um, there's actually quite quite a high barrier to entry because of the very high standards to get into um, and be awarded a bank license. I'm also pleased to advise that our savings platform is built and tested. So we're now ready. We've already used what we call friends and family to test the deposits, you know, our one year bonds, three year bonds, instant access accounts, 90 day notice accounts, et cetera, et cetera. And also, unusually for somebody at our stage, when we got our license, we launched four lending products. So we launched commercial real estate. Uh, we launched bridging loans, which is short term property back loans. We launched professional practice loans, which is lending to uh, professionals like accountants, solicitors. And we also launched working capital, which is very short term loans, things like VIT loans for three months, corporation tax loans and professional indemnity loans. So all those have been launched. We will further launch our professional buy to let product at the early part of quarter two. So again, that's a very advanced stage. So it's probably worth emphasizing our IT, fully integrated cloud-based IT is built. And the proposition and capability that we have, uh, in my judgment, certainly is more advanced than a lot of the more established competitors in the market. So we feel very confident and that inbound flow reinforces that confidence. So the only remaining condition will be the capital raise, which will allow us to, to remove the deposit restriction. I think furthermore, in terms of our distribution capability, we've already opened hubs in London. Uh, London's our head office, so London is open. Manchester is open. Um, we have about eight staff in our Manchester office. And Birmingham, Central Birmingham opens at the back end of this quarter. We're just delaying that because of COVID. Um, so we synchronise it with the vaccination programme, but, but the property has been sourced and is ready to go. And by 2022, we'll also have other strategic hubs. We're not going to, you know, we're, we're going to have a broader England and Wales approach, but we'll have offices in Bristol, Milton Keynes, East Midlands, and North East. And one of the things that drives that, we don't need branches, we're business to business. We deal with entrepreneurs and small businesses. So we can drive a lot of efficiency, a lot of cost savings. Okay, so in terms of the market itself, um, it's huge. The market is huge. Um, and despite the lack of proactivity of the big banks, really, to my mind, SMEs have been taken for granted. Uh, they haven't been given a very good service. But despite all of that, um, the big banks still hold over 85% of lending, which amounts to over £167 billion. So it's a huge sum of money. Um, in terms of the segment we're most interested in, it and where we feel it's most poorly served, is the debt quantum between £100,000 and £5 million. In fairness to the big banks, once they particularly go over £10 million, they start to provide a better service. Um, but we feel there's a real service gap in the market between £100,000 and £5 million. And we need to penetrate less than 1% to hit our five-year plan. So I think I'm really encouraged to say our proposition's built, um, and it's been built for SME specifically, and also crucially for the influencers that serve them. So be that professionals, be that specific introducers, the broker market that, that serve them. The proposition is digital, it's bespoke, it's responsive, and it's highly efficient. Um, I briefly touched on Phil Jenks, um, our chairman, before. Let me just contextualise it. So Phil actually uh, was chair of Charter Court. 
he built that from pretty well scratch. I think he was employee number 27. Um, and he went through an IPO. And recently it was merged with one savings bank with an enterprise value of over 750 million pounds. So Phil has been on this journey like for like in a way that I've been on the journey with Metro Bank in terms of building um, a successful SME loan book. I'd also point out that our executive team are incredibly experienced and capable. Let me give you one example. Bryce Glover, uh, the deputy CEO, um, led the nationwide commercial business. There was over £15 billion of lending. He also built from scratch um, offshore deposit taking and, and built that in less than two years for £3 billion. He was also managing director of Santander and Alliance and Leicester SME. So there's a good example. We've got over 280 years of experience in our executive and critically, we have successfully trodden a path when the market's difficult. And obviously some of the neo banks and some of the other potential competitors maybe haven't got that track record and capability. So in terms of just giving you a, a kind of very high level helicopter of the financials, <clears throat> using uh, one of the critical things is using technology, we can deliver superior financial results. Um, we actually break even uh, within 19 months of full license. So this is a model that isn't, you know, goodness knows when you're going to get to break even. Uh, it's very, very focused on investor returns. We break even within 19 months of full license and we get full back, full payback of all investments since inception in the early part of 2018 within three years of full license. Um, Recognise will have an upper quartile return on equity. So you can see on this slide by March 27, uh, the very bottom column there, the return on equity is 17%. I point out that's based on a pure equity calculation. As we build our loan book, there will be a point, typically three or 400 million pounds when we'll use things like securitization, which drives capital efficiency, and that will drive return on equity up. So we see those figures as de minimis figures. Um, we think there's upside. Um, on those. So 17% before optimization and a cost to income ratio, which is the, the most important efficiency measure, particularly for analysts in the city uh, in the 30s, which again uh, will put us in the top quartile in terms of performance after five years trading. We also believe we, we can see the demand. Uh, we've seen very substantial interest in a very short period of time. So we have set what we believe are aggressive but achievable growth targets. Um, by the end of the first year post license, which we'd expect to be March 22, we're forecasting a loan book of 250 million pounds. Just to put that into context, um, a recent competitor that launched ahead of us in the same time span achieve 40 million pounds. So we're quite, we're quite ambitious, but we believe those targets are very achievable. So just to summarize, um, our parent is an aimlistic company, as Michael has said, very supportive, has taken us through this journey. We've also got very supportive shareholders, also uh, Michael emphasized with Parasol and other anchor shareholders. Our technology is built, it's been tested, and it's also been third party assured by Deloitte and it's actually live, we're trading as we speak. Um, my executive committee is in place and has been in place now for two years. I've got con continuity and real focus. Our initial demand um, has exceeded our expectation over 120 million pounds in six trading weeks. I'm very pleased with the quality of the counterparties, uh, the borrowers that are coming to talk to us. And I'm also happy to see that the margins align to our financial plan. Our savings platform is built and it's ready for the deposit restriction to be lifted, which we expect to be the end of March or in very early part of April. And as we submit our final mobilisation conditions, those will be submitted by the end of January, which is the final aspects um, other than the capital that will allow us to be fully licensed before uh, the end of quarter two, uh, 2021. So um, having raised over 40 million pounds, the final aspect now is the need to raise a minimum of 30 million pounds to move to the full license. Thank you all very much.
Fantastic. Um, Jason, uh, Michael, Ben, thank you very much indeed. Um, ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those investor questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you that a recording of the presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard on the Investor Meet Company platform. Lastly, before I hand back to Michael, Jason and Ben, I'd like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company. Immediately after the presentation has ended, you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback in order the company can better understand your views and expectations. Um, I guess I perhaps haven't given you a huge amount of time to, to review some of the questions that we've had in, um, but if I could just hand back to you guys and we can just run through. If I could ask you just to read out um, who the question is from and uh, just give your answers. Um, I think Michael, perhaps start with you. If you can just start at the top, that'd be great. Uh, Alexander S has asked, any chance of current investors being allowed to participate um, in a future capital raise? Uh, the answer is subject, obviously, to to um, conversations with our uh, invest with our professional advisors, because uh, obviously this is not going to be a an open offer to all shareholders. We plan to have a placing, so uh, we we'd have to go through some some process with you. Uh, but I think if you're in touch with us, then we'll be able to introduce you to the appropriate people. Maybe I can pick up uh, Nick Jai's question, second question on there, which is how are you setting yourself apart from the competition in looking to win new business? Really good question. Thank you for that, Nick. Um, first thing is, I think if you look at our technology platform, it's unique, um, the integrated cloud by SaaS, but then also um, the synthesis with digital relationship management. At the minute, companies do not get um the relationship manager typically they don't get the intimacy the knowledge they don't build up the relationship they don't have access to senior decision makers but also point out our distribution strategy so we're not mono focused some of our competitors are broker only they get all their business from the broker tunnel when you look at our diversity of distribution um hub strategy we have people in those hubs doing direct origination. We, of course, do get broker introduced business, and it's very important to run board. But we also have the professional sector. We also have affinity groups um, uh, and, a, and a broad cross section in terms of black books. So I think for me, um, the, you know, we recognize that the SME um, segment is the backbone of the economy. It makes up 52% of GDP, and it's been underserved. And that's my key differentiator. I'm going to serve them and serve them very well. Fantastic. Ben, perhaps I could hand over to you just to, to run through the, the rest of the questions and just um, pass them to, to either Michael or Jason or yourself as you go through, if that's OK. Sure. Um, question from Simon C um, to Jason. Who do you consider your main competitors and what sets recognise apart from them? OK, thank you, Simon. So um, it's it, we're in a very turbulent phase at the minute, and I would probably link um, my response in a little bit with COVID, because what COVID's done, for most established players, COVID is a threat, not an opportunity. They're looking at backbook delinquency. They're looking at monitoriums. They're certainly taking their eye off the ball on the front end. Um, so there's a constriction in supply of credit. So when we look at our day-to-day -day competitors out in the market right now, answering your question directly, it's not the big five banks. And actually, a number of the challenges are sitting on the sidelines. The main competition we're noticing day-to-day -day is Alica Bank and Red Bank. They're the ones we've seen day-to-day. -day. But I what I would say about COVID, as awful as it is for the economy, and I'm desperately, desperately sorry for you know the loss of life and the, the economic carnage that it's causing, a new entrant bank with no legacy book it gives us a unique opportunity to build a very strong foundation with counterparties borrowers are a better quality than we would normally expect for a new entrant bank so it's actually an unprecedented opportunity for us as sad as the background context is and moving on to michael um, a question from peter l sure. have you considered the sale of milton homes Yes, yeah, so Peter, thanks for that. That's a, a, it's a great question. So uh, Milton Home is a, is a mature portfolio. So, uh, you know, we, we currently have quite a lot of properties that have come back to us. So we have a number of properties that are, on, that are for sale. So we do see the uh, portfolio liquidating relatively quickly over the next few years. 
but yes, we, we are considering a potential sale. Um, it's not something that we're currently actively doing, but we are considering a potential sale because obviously that would help in both the funding of the capital that recognised needs to get through its next stage so that it's able to start taking deposits. But as you, you correctly say in your in your question, it would then actually give us a complete focus. So the, you know, the City London Group will be recognised back. So yeah, we are looking at it and uh, we're considering options at, at the moment, but thank you for the question. Back to Jason. Um, how many accounts do you foresee each of your account managers handling? And that's from Bob M. Okay. Um, I don't want to bore you with too much detail, Bob, but what I've built in the model is a bit different to the traditional way that the most banks operate. So I have three key parties when I onboard clients. I have my relationship director, who is the client interface. I have a credit partner who's got responsibility for underwriting. And I have somebody from my loan management unit and their job I'm boarding the client, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm boarding the client, dealing with the lawyers, getting the loan to draw down, but then critically management and control of that exposure, a covenant check-in, an ongoing monitoring control. So because of the way I build the model, it allows my relationship directors to have around 80% of their time dedicated to business development, which drives our efficiency because those relationship directors the most expensive resource out of those three cohorts of people so in terms of account hold account holdings it's much higher traditionally than you'd see in some of our competitors so let me just give you a very quick example if we took an investment client where we're doing quarterly covenant check and an annual review you can probably hold three to four hundred of those clients in a portfolio because it's a relatively infrequent uh, control mechanism However, if I've got a client, which invariably I hope to have, where clients are doing repeat business, I get a good share of wallet and they keep coming back to me, then I'd probably only be expecting to have about 100 to 150 of those clients in a portfolio. So it's all, it's all about the intensity of contact and the demand from the client. But what I can say, and as you can see in the cost to income ratio, is with the technology and the way that we manage our positions, we drive a lot of efficiency. Thanks, Jason. Um, moving on to a question from Martin G. Uh, how has your lending criteria changed towards commercial properties since COVID-19, i.e. more optimistic on warehousing, less on office and retail? Yeah, so so again, a really good question. Um, we constantly monitor um, the market. Real estate, you know, collateral is an absolutely fundamental part of our um, credit risk management framework. So the sort of things that have changed, firstly, we've built a virtual onboarding process. So if we continue to have lockdowns, we're in a lockdown, we continue to have problems. We've built flexibility into how we onboard clients to, so that doesn't slow us down. And critically, the SLAs with both our lawyers and our valuers. In terms of the um, criterion around real estate, we've moved away from single use assets. So I like collateral that has a secondary market so that, God forbid, in the event of distress, I can repossess that asset and, and liquidate it through a secondary market. So obviously, you know, residential property, but commercial real estate that does have a secondary market. So, for example, um, in the leisure sector at the minute, that's been heavily impacted. Uh, my appetite for a caravan park would be pretty limited because of its rather restricted nature. So, but, if I've got collateral that has single use, or if I have collateral that's tertiary, it's not in prime locations, then I would look at that um, much more um, much more closely. One of the things to give you some comfort, Martin, is we always use RICS, Red Book Valuations, on all of our collateral. And also one of the questions that we ask up front is what's the 180-day force four-star valuation of the collateral. So if we did have a distress situation, how quickly could we deal with that situation? So we look at all of those factors up front. We do a lot of sensitivity analysis around the collateral. It's such a key area, as well as debt service, as well as the personal solvency of the borrowers. But it's it's we, we've got advisors. We have two property advisors, Hamptons on there. Um, all SOPs are on there. So we constantly look at this. It's a very key area for us, but we're very happy with the quality of the counterparties and, and the net worths and the quality of the people that we're, we're trading with. Just to give you some context, 
a point of sale we've already declined over 50 percent of all the inbound flow so we are quite selective with the sort of counterparty that we want to serve thanks Jason and do recognize plan to launch working capital products a question from Robin S and again to you Jason yeah it, as a new bank Robin um, we obviously work in relatively narrow tram lines so we do have some working capital uh, facilities which I mentioned briefly earlier which is VIT loans corporation tax loans and professional indemnity loans but we are a secured lender so there are a number of players in the market particularly at the smaller end of S the SME the small end you know you've got bounce back loans uh, you've got Sibyl, you've got some unsecured loan providers. That's not really our market. Our market are established entrepreneurs with a strong balance sheet, a good track record of profitability, collateral on the balance sheet that want to grow and build their business. And they actually see COVID as an opportunity for growth um, rather than um, a negative. So we're, we're really serving the slightly more mature, slightly bigger um, category of SME. And typically, that will be lending 100,000 to 5 million pounds. So that's who we're targeting in our approach. Thank you, Jason. Um, question from me, would you uh, like to tell the, the audience a little bit about uh, the challenges or, or, or that you see ahead for Recognise in a given industry, uh, obviously opportunities as well, and, and what you as CEO are, are excited about building over the next few years? Yeah, well, I can genuinely say, you know, I've been in this industry all my working life and, and I am absolutely passionate about the critical importance of SMEs. They are kind of a, a little bit like the NHS sometimes, that they're unsung heroes because they're over a half of our national output and they don't always get the prominence and profile um, that they deserve. So I, I think we're going through a very, very difficult period and, and we need to support SMEs to the extent we can and I think the government have done a pretty decent job in difficult circumstances I think my proposition the intimacy that I want to create the responsiveness um, I'm already getting a lot of old friends where um, I have banked them at RBS or NatWest or Metro in the past or Close Brothers um, there are really strong counterparties that have been desperately looking for a bank that cares about SMEs, that want to build genuine relationships, that want to get to know them and want to respond effectively. So I'm hugely excited by the potential. I do think the big banks have let the sector down and I'm not sure they can change the tanker very quickly to do anything about it, unfortunately. And they've got legacy systems, um, decades old, that are very difficult. My technology platform is cutting edge. It's very responsive. It's there for the client. It's been built for the customer experience. It helps them take more ownership. Uh, it helps them build more intimacy and responsiveness. Um, so we're super excited. We think we've got a really, really strong proposition and that's been borne out by the feedback we're getting uh, in the early days of our launch. Great, thank you very much, Jason. Michael, can I pass back to you for a closing uh, statement from CEO of City of London Group? Hi, sir. No, so thank you. So I and I think Sis Under Group is a is a name that uh, a number of the people on the call may have heard for some time, uh, but hopefully you will have seen and understood that uh, since October 17 when we changed strategy and early 18 when Jason uh, and the recognised management team joined, we've been on a very very clear path to getting to where we get to now, which is basically to to build a bank that is focused on the SME sector. We started out with an understanding that there was a, a great demand in the marketplace. It's, I think, the demand and the opportunity now. We thought it was great then. I think it's even greater now than it was when we started. So I am very excited about the next few years. Uh, I think we've got a great team. Uh, we've got very supportive shareholders. And uh, the next part, the next couple of years, are really, I would say, we are a, we're a company to watch. But uh, thank you, for everybody, for, for joining us. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Michael, Jason and Ben for addressing those questions from investors and any further questions that do come through. Obviously, um, the company will review all of those questions submitted today and those uh, answers will publish on the Investor Meet Company platform. Thank you again to Michael, Jason and Ben for updating investors today. Um, could I ask investors not to close the session as you will be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback. If you've accessed the meeting from the website, 
the feedback page will appear in front of you. If you've accessed via the link sent in the email, you'll be asked to log in and submit your feedback. And we do ask you to do so, as it only takes a few seconds. It's greatly appreciated by the company. So on behalf of City of London Group PLC and Investor Meet Company, thank you again for attending today's presentation. And good morning. Good morning. Thank you.